Good morning, church. Uh, would you please stand with us and uh, let's just worship the King of Kings together. Praise the 
Today's Palm Sunday. I think you see the little palms that all our kids have. Um, but it's the day that we enter Holy Week. Um, and this day uh, commemorates Jesus' entry into Jerusalem um, as people laid out these palm branches um, to honor him as king. But um, he wasn't the king that anybody was really expecting. Um, Jesus wrote in not on a stallion, but on a donkey. Um, he wasn't adorned with a crown of gold, but a crown of thorns. Um, and he entered town knowing um, his fate to be crucified. And by Friday, he hung on that old rugged cross. Um, and the kingdom of God is a uh, holy other than any of our kingdoms. Um, and as we sing this next song together, I just invite you to lay down all the other things that you cling to and um, join Jesus in carrying a cross.
despised by the world, a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark cavalry. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. What was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The beach was far too wide. But from the far side of
Sacrifice was made. 
You may be seated this morning, and as you are, we get to celebrate on the other side of Palm Sunday knowing the full reality of what Jesus was coming to accomplish. And um, we should live and dwell in that reality that he came not just to give us a, a kingdom, politically speaking, but that he, gave, he came to give us a kingdom where we were in right relationship with God. He came to forgive our sin and to sanctify his people to a different way of life, a life that was separate and wholly other from the life that every other kingdom had attempted to provide. And so this morning, when, when we come to, to the altar of need, when we come and we bring and present our requests to God as our provider and our protector and our sustainer, we should come with this mindset that, in my mind, I have all these ideas of what salvation looks like. And in my mind, Jesus comes on a stallion. And in my mind, Jesus comes with a war sword. And in my mind, Jesus fights and fights my enemies and puts them under my feet right now. But that we need to lay aside what we have in our mind so we can receive what Jesus has in his mind. We need to lay down our crowns at the feet of Jesus who laid down his crown emptied himself, Philippians 2 said, and humbled himself and became obedient to death. And now the invitation to us today is that if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up a cross. The profound and amazing truth, though, is that his blood and his cross was the first of many that would bring resurrection life. So whatever you're suffering, though it seems counterintuitive to lay down your vision of deliverance, Jesus has promised that when we lay down our crowns, he does restore us to new life, that when we take on a crown of thorns and a cross of suffering, that ultimately one day we will rise as Jesus rose and we will sit with him as co-heirs, ruling and reigning with him in a kingdom that has no end and that is unshakable and that bears none of the burdens and sorrows of this world any longer. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Thank you, Jesus, for being the firstborn of many. This morning we come to you and remember that your kingdom is not of this world. This morning we come to you and remember that there is only one thing that will make us complete, and that is to surrender to you, Jesus. And so we bring all of our needs and all of our cares and concerns and all of our ideas and visions of life and this in this world, and we lay them at your feet, and we open our hands. When we put down the palms, Lord, I just pray that you would redeem them and lead us into the kingdom that you had in mind for us, and that when we do that, that just as you became the Savior of the world, we would become a blessing to the world. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the Lord of hosts, the commander of heaven's armies. And every power and authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. And so we lay our confidence in you and we release everything that is of us to receive you this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here where two or three are gathered. We know that you're there among us. And so, Lord, we just uh, ask that you would open our hearts to see your presence this morning, to hear your voice, and to yield our will and our spirits to you so that we might have life and have it to the full. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Good morning, church. We are so glad that you are here uh, at CNC this morning. I'm Pastor Ryan, and if you are a visitor this morning, we would love for you to meet Pastor Stephen in the foyer after. We'll have a small gift for you and just want you to feel welcomed and that this is a place to belong for you and your family. I'm not sure why he's bringing a pillow up here, but um, we are typically the ones that want the pillow. So... Uh, this week, uh, coming up, as Amanda said earlier, it is Holy Week, and so a little bit busier of a schedule, 
Uh, we'll have our regular Wednesday night activities, a meal at 515, and discipleship classes following that. And Maundy Thursday, we are going to do a Seder meal. If you have no idea what that is, then you and your entire family uh, need to be here Thursday. It is um, a full family experience. Um, and Pastor Jenny is going to lead us uh, through that. Uh, it'll be a great experience. 6.30 Thursday night, and then 6.30 on Friday night, Good Friday. Um, we will have an adult service as well as a children's service uh, separately um, on Good Friday. And then for Sunday morning, we will do breakfast from 9.30 to 10.20, and then we will celebrate the risen king. So put those things in your calendar. You'll get a text reminder uh, at 1 o'clock today. It's already been scheduled, so you'll get it. Uh, if you're not signed up, come let me know, and I'll be out in the foyer after church. Thanks for being here. All right, kiddos, you are, uh, you are welcome to meet Pastor Jenny uh, at the door. Please don't exit until you see her and you are able to walk with her. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Blessed, I hope. Trusting in Christ. Rooted in Him. Established and built up, I hope. We'll be talking about that this morning. Colossians chapter 2. We're studying Colossians. Um, we are in like week 6 of our study of of the book of Colossians, or the letter to the Colossians. Um, no, my name is not Mike Lindell, but this is my pillow. So, <laughs> this is my pillow. Uh, I get to sleep on it sometimes. Uh, <laughs> anybody with little kids knows how that goes. Uh, anybody who's ever been hit by a tornado knows how that goes. Sometimes you don't sleep on your pillow. Uh, <laughs> All of us have one of these, right? I, I'm assuming, I'm guessing, I think all of you have a pillow. Uh, but not all of us have a good relationship with our pillow. Uh, some people, you get up at night for <laughs> a variety of reasons. Some people find it hard to fall asleep. Uh, I was Googling sleep deprivation stories. There are many. Um, a couple, though. One man said, I once spent five minutes searching desperately for my cell phone. I spent five minutes searching and complaining the whole time about it being missing to my wife, who was on the other end of the call that I was making on the cell phone that was in my hand. <laughs> After a particularly long night of little sleep, she finally asked me, honey, what phone are you speaking to me on? <laughs> and he realized that uh, he... He said, he said I, have, I was having such an out-of-body experience, I just hung up. Like, I just I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I read about another man many years ago who said he had to do a presentation, and when he got to the meeting, he opened up his briefcase and realized that he'd been carrying a backgammon board all morning. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> if you have trouble sleeping, you're not alone. Between 50 and 70 million Americans have some kind of sleep disorder or find it difficult to sleep for a variety of reasons. And this is a really long way around to uh, introducing the title of my message this morning, Sleepless in Rome. Because Paul is writing to the Colossians, and he doesn't say that he's having trouble sleeping, but he is greatly concerned about an issue, and oftentimes our worries and anxieties are one of the contr key contributing factors to our lack of sleep. So I'm going to put this down. It's, it feels so squishy and nice that I could go for a nap right now, but... Put it down. Colossians chapter 2, Paul is kind of introduced in, in chapter 1 some of uh, who he is and some of the concern that he has while also commending them and building them up, what he's heard about them, and now he's going to get more into uh, what is really causing him to lose sleep or to be concerned. Uh, Colossians chapter 2 verse 1, he says, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea, a neighboring church. And for all who have not met me personally, that word struggling, conflict, agony, he's in turmoil. It, it means an intense strain. Paul is bothered about something. Something's keeping him up at night. And this is not unusual if you know the writings of Paul, 2 Corinthians 11. Remember I told you about that long list of suffering that he, he laid out as, a, as an apostle? 
I didn't read the last line of that section. Uh, he ends with, in addition to having been stoned and put in prison and being shipwrecked and bitten by snakes and all of that, he says, I have daily my deep concern for all the churches. So this is not unusual for Paul. But what is uh, different in this situation, keep in mind that Paul has never met this group, these churches. It says, for all who have not met me personally, that's basically most of the church. Remember that the church at Colossae and the church at uh, Laodicea was then an offshoot of the church at Colossae, was founded by Epaphras and, uh, and was meeting in the home of Philemon. So Paul didn't start this church. He's actually never been to it. He hears what's going on, the trouble that it's having, because Epaphras tra- traveled like uh, a thousand miles on foot to tell him what's going on, and he was bothered enough by it to write this letter. And there were teachers bringing new ideas about Jesus, their own ideas about Jesus. And Paul is concerned that these teachers are so persuasive that the church is going to be swayed by them. He says, that keeps me up at night. Mark Twain said, a lie can make it halfway around the world while truth is still lacing up its boots. A lie can make it halfway around, and it's true. It's true. Falsehood seems to travel much more quickly than truth. Lies travel quickly. Gossip travels quickly. It seems truth often makes progress at a much slower and deliberate pace. So Paul's saying, hey, I am deeply concerned that you are not running with the truth, that you, are, you have instead fell in lock and step with the falsehood that has come into your midst, that you've been diverted off your course, and I am pleading with you, I am awake at night worrying that you would once again, run with the truth. And so he's going to address this problem in three ways, and that's what in the rest of our verses, verses 2 through 10, we're going to look at these ways. He's going to say, first of all, the way that you run with the truth is you need to believe. You need, you need to think about what you believed when you first came to Christ. You, I want you to know something, that, and you need to know it and understand it and believe it and hide it deep down in your heart so that you might not sin against God. How does a young man keep, away, keep his way pure? By living according to God's word. The psalmist writes uh, ad nauseum about the importance of being firmly and securely sure and understanding of what you believe. And then he's going to say that at, once you believe, you, you're called to become something, not just know, but you grow in that. You've got to grow in your lifestyle and become like Jesus. Running with the truth means becoming like Jesus. And then he says... But even after you've done that, you still need to always be diligent and watchful. Jesus himself warned the disciples. The disciples said, hey, when are the, how will we know when the end is near? How will we know when you're about to return? How will we know? When, and he says, well, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and famine and plague. And if, I don't know if the disciples did this, but if you're like me, you're like, which era of human history is that not true of? And Jesus' point is instead what he says after he says those things. He says, But I tell you, and he'll tell a parable about being ready and being diligent and being watchful and being prepared and being on your being ready for Christ to return. He is going to return. Really, the world is ripe for it all the time. You just need to be ready. Instead of worrying about dates and times, he says, I don't even know. You just be ready. Be so Paul says the same thing. He says, You need to you believe and you're becoming like Jesus, but you still need to beware. You need to be slow to entertain other people's bad opinions about Jesus, and you need to be constantly diligent to uh, continue in your belief and to continue becoming like Jesus. So verse 2, he says, my purpose is that they may be encouraged, the members of the Colossae church and the Laodicea church, that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. So, Paul's first concern is that they believe the right things about Jesus, that they have an understanding and a knowledge. My purpose is that you be encouraged and united in love so you can have complete understanding of Jesus. I want to look at that phrase, encouraged in heart. So when we think of heart, oftentimes our our mind might first and foremost go to the fact that it's the vital organ of the body. We think of Uh, When we think of heart, we also talk about the heart as the place where we feel things. That's the way it's most commonly used in culture and in our vernacular. Our emotions, 
And it is that. It's the seat of your emotions. You might have heard before it's not about head knowledge, it's about heart knowledge. So you can know, but if you, you've got to bring your heart in line with what your head knows. And that's true. But we often set up a false dichotomy of our, of our heart versus our head, which is an unhealthy paradigm. From a bi- biblical perspective, the heart actually was the mind. The heart was the mind. They're synonymous with each other. It says in Proverbs 23, 7, and that's the verse on the screen, as a person thinks in their heart, so are they. As a person thinks in their heart, so are they. So it's the, the heart is not only the seat of our emotions, but it's where we process our thoughts. It's the seat of our will, like where our decisions are formed and ultimately come from. Jesus actually said that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's in our heart, what forms up in our heart, what we think in our heart, what we believe in our heart, what we decide in our heart, is actually what's gonna come out of us no matter what we say on the outside. It's the place that you understand or don't understand things. That's your heart. Emotions, yes, but also the mind, the will, and your understanding. So what Paul is saying in these first few verses is, look, I'm really concerned that you guys have doubts in your mind as to who Jesus really is. And those doubts about Jesus are going to disrupt your unity. It's going to disrupt your ability to be knit together in love, to function as the church, to be filled with the Spirit, and, and each one of you live your purpose as a member of the body of Christ. You need to believe the right things about Jesus so that you can work in harmony as one body, fulfilling one faith and one baptism. Verse 3 in, he says, I want you to know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. So right thinking and right belief is heavy in Paul's concern. He says the opposite, uh, the opposite of what's true about Jesus are all kinds of hollow and deceptive human philosophies. That's in verse 8. And he says, I'm concerned that as you are exposed to these, uh, the op- these human philosophies, that you're going to be persuaded by fine-sounding arguments. And I want to draw your attention to these terms, philosophy, arguments, persuasion, wisdom, knowledge, because I want you to see that following Jesus is in part, maybe large part, a mental activity. It's something that we decide before we put one foot in front of the other. It's, it's something that we have to work out internally. When, when Paul says to work out your faith with fear and trembling, he, mean, he means with great diligence, with great obsession, strengthen your heart and mind muscle so that you can decide first and foremost in your heart and then the rest of you will come into lock and step with the Holy Spirit. He says, you need to understand who Jesus is, that he's the creator, he's the sustainer, he's the head of the church, he's the reconciler of all humanity, and he has the final word because in him is the fullness of God. There is nothing that is in God that is not in Jesus. So root yourselves in those truths. He says, Jesus is the treasure chest, in verse 3, of all wisdom and all knowledge. So we need to know the fullness of Christ so that we can live in the fullness of life. We need to know in our our head and in our heart his resurrected life. When we sing, I would encourage you to pray, God, help me to believe and deeply internalize the truths of these songs that we sing. Help, help, help Help me to internalize these promises from these songs that are based on your word and from the scriptures that we read so that in the middle of the week, when I begin to doubt and when I become anxious and when I become overwhelmed and and when my hormones get out of whack and when my mood sours and when things don't go my way, that I'll remember that fullness of life is in you and it's promised and it's guaranteed and it's been settled and it's final. What you believe about Jesus is the most important thing about you, 100%. What you believe about Jesus is the most important thing about you. Uh, A.W. Tozer said, what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. We've talked about that before. Ultimately, 
it begins with what God believes about you, what God has chosen to believe about you and to speak over you and to offer to you. And then what's, what's important about you is how you respond to that. Your purpose, your life, your wholeness is completely dependent on how you respond to the truth of Jesus. I've been really just captivated by this thought because I think it explains so much of what I witness in the Christian experience that I share. I already said this once, but I, I've just been turning it over and over and over. Pastor Matty Montgomery at my brother's church in Johnson City, Tennessee, uh, he, he said the, hard, the, hard, the difficulty of the gospel is accepting that the solution could be that simple for such a big problem. We just can't believe that God really loves us that simply and that profoundly. We, can't re- we, we, we feel like there's got to be something I've got to do. And so we're constantly held captive by, this fe- by these feelings of unworthiness and these feelings of failure when Jesus has said, I have paid the price. I have paid it all. And you just get up and walk, receive it and walk in it. I've been captivated by the way that plays out in my life as a father Like, no matter what failures occur in my kids' lives, ultimately, I want them to come to me, work those out with me, and receive love, and know that there is nothing that we won't, that we won't work together to come back from. There's nothing, there's nothing that, uh, that, that Casey and I haven't already chosen to give to them that would, that we'd ever take away under any circumstance to the one who would just say, mom, dad, I want to walk with you. I want to work this out with you. And it's the same with our Heavenly Father. I've been turning this over as I think about the unconditional love of, 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 true, uh, of true marriage, of true, of true love, that, that there is nothing that we won't work through. I've been, been going through pre-marriage counseling with multiple couples, and we've just been talking about how those, the, we're making a vow. The, biggest, the, the thing that makes marriage sacred is it's not a temporary commitment. We make these vows. We are holding this so sacred that for better or for worse, and I love to highlight that. I'm like, I always tell people the best time to get divorced is before you get married. After that, there's a whole lot of baggage. It, it, and, and after that, it's not, it's not, uh, it wasn't God's best for you. So let's talk about this now, this commitment that you're making to one another for better or for worse. And when that love is, is true and real, there is nothing that we don't come back from. And so we have a, but we have a hard time receiving that. We have a hard time accepting that. And so, so many relationships with, with people and with God, are burdened by this inability to just accept love. And I wonder if that's you this morning. That mentally you are struggling to believe that no matter how short you feel like you fall, God loves you, God has a purpose for you, and he will do it in you. What you believe about Jesus is the most important thing about you what he believes about you, actually, is the most important thing about you, but secondarily, the ball is in your court to believe it and receive it. So following Jesus is a mental activity. And did you know all of us are theologians? Did you know that? All of us are. And you say, not me, I don't do theology. I don't, I, actually, you do. In fact, even you saying you don't really do theology is a kind of theology. Just, just like an atheist says, I don't believe in, well, yeah, you do. You, you believe in yourself as God. You've set yourself up as, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You believe that your knowledge and whatever knowledge that you put your hope in in the world is higher than any other knowledge you could attain. We're all theologians. You have some opinion as to who God is or isn't. You can't avoid being a theologian. I would say because theology being the study of God, and since God's image is in you, that's why. But whatever, you you can't help but have a belief about what governs the world and what guides the world. The question really is not, are you a theologian, but are you a good one or a bad one? And so what Paul's saying is the more you know, the more you understand truth, specifically the truth about Jesus, the more you will be able to detect error and live a better, more complete life. The more you're able to detect error, you'll be able to stand against those who promote error and who lead you into error. So it's important that you believe and know and understand that you immerse yourself in the truth about Jesus. Colossians chapter 2 verse 5, for though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and I delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So those terms, uh, orderly and firm, they're actually military terms. They're Greek military terms. 
good order, steadfastness. It speaks about soldiers who stand in formation and make a solid, united front. Standing together for the truth, knowing the truth together will keep you standing strong. James Montgomery Boyce, he says, we do not have a strong church today, nor do we have many strong Christians. We can trace the cause to an acute lack of sound spiritual knowledge. They have forgotten what God is like and what he promises to do for those who trust him. Ask an average Christian to talk about God, and after getting past the expected answers, you will find that their God is a little God with vacillating sentiments. When I think about this, I think mental fortitude or the lack thereof is one of the hottest topics of our culture right now. Mental health, right? And I, I, I am turning this over all the time because I see a distinct difference in the way generations cope with things. I see a distinct difference in um, the way that parents are doing things. And I'm trying to put all these pieces together and understand, and I, there's a lot of data. But let me, let me just summarize this. I'm becoming more and more convinced that while there is much we can learn and do medically to treat mental health, the best medicine would be to form an orderly and firm belief with deep knowledge and understanding. There is a tendency, there, there is a, we live in a time in our culture where information is at its freest and fullest. And so we are bogged down by bad news. We are bogged down by all kinds of opinions. And we are pulled, uh, the, the mental exercise that you have to do to even try to process a few of those things is showing in the way that our bodies are acting and our minds are acting. We were designed to live in truth. And it is deception that is, pulls our minds apart, apart. It's lies from the enemy that pulls our minds apart. The scriptures are chock full of warnings about how the enemy is a liar and a deceiver. Chock full of descriptions of our enemy as an accuser of the brethren. His whole thing is to lie to you, to deceive you, to pull your mind in many directions and fill you with anxieties and worries that cloud out your ability to see clearly the truth that has been secured for you in Jesus. That's his whole thing. It's the biggest battle we're fighting. That's why the helmet in the, body of, in, in the, in the, in the armor of God is a helmet of salvation. It's to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus that the truth about Jesus would help you filter and sort through all the rest of the philosophies, the human philosophies of our world. The enemy uses our mental weariness to further bury us in mental weariness. So if he can get us confused by all kinds of philosophies and all kinds and all kinds of beliefs about where we stand with God, if he can get us bogged down in bad news and, and bad theology about the hope of our world, then he can bury us even further in that weariness. Because what we do when we are isolated and worn out is we isolate ourselves and wear ourselves out more. Right? And so Paul says the solution to this is to have a complete and full understanding and knowledge of Jesus. By the way, no, no joking here. This is why I preach long. It's why I encourage an abundance of gathering together, of studying and fellowshipping, because I don't want anyone who comes here to ever be spiritually illiterate. I find it amusing that we can simultaneously criticize our world for its spiritual illiteracy but then complain about spending an abundant amount of time becoming literate in the things of the Spirit. <laughs> I understand the practical concerns, but at the end of the day, I have settled deeply in my heart that I want you to be the best loved by the community around you and the best fed congregation in the state of Tennessee, if not in the United States of America. I don't know if I'm accomplishing that. I'm not, I, would, I don't know that I'll ever feel that I'm accomplishing that, but that is my goal and my philosophy when it comes to teaching and gathering together. I will continue to offer thorough teaching because I need it and I believe that you need it. And we will continue to offer every opportunity for us to gather together because I'm 100% convinced 
that the way that you recover from life is not to isolate yourself, but to join together with the body of Christ in which you were made for. Second Timothy warns that the days when the end will come will be the days when people heap up teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear, and people will then turn aside to fables. We live in a Christian culture that has joined with the secular culture in trying to live off of sound bites, trying to live, live off of quick doses of Jesus that makes no time to study thoroughly and believe firmly and confidently. So all we have left is TikTok and Instagram and short YouTube clips. If I look at the data of our YouTube channel, for example, the average watch time of our you know, 40 to 60 minute messages is 13 minutes. And so some, that's some, some people make the argument, well, you need to teach shorter. No way. We need to commit ourselves to Christ. We need to commit ourselves to believing fully all the things of Jesus. I will not bow to the tendencies of our culture that have made it sick. Jeremiah 5, 30 and 31 says, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule by their own power and my people love to have it so. There's plenty wrong with how our country came to be, but there was also plenty right about the mission, vision, and faith of the founding fathers. One of the stories that I look at is uh, our tendency and desire for higher education and the purpose that uh, people sought higher education. In the year 1636, just 16 years after the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, they decided we need a school. Why? Specifically, to educate preachers and clergymen for the gospel's sake. And they decided to name the school after one of their best-known young preachers, a guy by the name of John Harvard. Harvard University was founded in 1636 to train preachers and clergymen for the gospel's sake. I'm not making any comments on their mission these days, but in the beginning, their purpose, and I quote, was, after God had carried us safe to New England and we had builded our houses, that's a quote, not me, not a typo. We had builded our houses, provided necessar necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the civil government. One of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to posterity. In other words, we want our kids and grandkids to grow up smart. Why? And I quote, dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. So this is what kept Paul up at night. It's honestly, it's what, if anything's going to keep us up at night, this is what should keep us up at night. It should be to study and to believe and know thoroughly the truths of Jesus. It should be to talk with other Christians and encourage them in their walk and to text them and say, I just felt a burden for you, brother, sister. How can I pray for you? These are the things that should keep us up at night. And I, I'm pretty sure... <laughs> that we will find, like Acts chapter 2, that when we dedicate ourselves to those things, that that is when we will find rich and abundant life and that the Lord is adding to our number daily those who are being saved. So believe is the first directive Paul gives. Verse 6, so then, just as you received, or you could also insert the word believed, Christ, Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. So don't just believe, but become let your activity catch up with your mind. Become what you believe, in other words, because actually the New Testament word believe is not just a mental assent, but it is aligning our life with that which our mind has determined or received or believed. Become what you believe. As you receive Jesus Christ as Lord, live in him as Lord. Become like him as Lord. How many here have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Thanks be to God. So you're saved. Now, become like Jesus. Become like Jesus. Paul's first concern is that they know. His second concern is that they grow. Some of your translations might say, walk in him. What does it mean to walk in Christ? Well, it's your lifestyle. Walk this way. Can I talk to you? What does it mean? That's your lifestyle. It's what you do every day of your life. A walk is a biblical term for your lifestyle, how you conduct your life. It's the consistent conduct over an entire lifetime. It's how you live your life. So live in him. Walk 
in him. Walk like Jesus. The idea is simply this. Paul says, continue to believe the truth about Jesus Christ. Don't stop believing the truth about Jesus Christ and let the truth of Jesus Christ affect every part of your life. That's what it means to live in him. I was thinking this is what probably breaks a pastor's heart, at least this pastor's heart. What really makes me lose sleep is thinking about people that once were vibrant in the faith who are growing in the faith and experiencing God in profound and powerful ways, and they were very involved in the church, and they were excited to follow Jesus, and then they're just gone. Or one day they just, something happens, or maybe, maybe the, the concerns of life, the hurts of life butt in, and the habits change, and new philosophies begin to persuade with fine-sounding arguments, and they drift away. So, so Paul says, don't just believe the right th- things about Jesus, but then begin to walk in it. And don't stop walking. Keep walking in, in, in the character and way of Christ. Walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Don't ever let the human philosophies creep in. Verse 7. He says, continue to live in him rooted and built up in him. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Three things, he says, that we do to walk with Christ and to live in Christ. First, in verse 6, he says, keep moving forward so you don't slip backwards. As you have received Christ as Lord, so walk in him. That is in the present tense. It's this idea that you've got to keep moving. In other words, you once received Christ. Awesome. We're glad that you got saved whatever day you did, but now walk in him. Continue constantly, daily, Walk in him. Don't stop. Keep moving forward so you don't slip backwards. Charles Spurgeon said, the Christian life is like climbing a hill of ice. You can't slide up. Which makes sense, right? Have you ever heard the term backslide? Never heard the term upslide, right? What happened to that Christian? Oh, man, he upslid. He just like, he hit a, he hit a good spot, and it was like a, like a video game. It just propel, propelled him forward. No, we do say he backslid. And Spurgeon continues, he says, if you want to know how to backslide, stop going forward. Cease going upward and you'll go downward of necessity. You can never stand still. Maybe we should even say if you're not going forward, then you might be going backward. Or at least you're about to. (laughs) There are always next steps. We never plateau and say, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, I'm a Christian, I'm mature, they used to say, I used to, hear, used to hear pastors say, you're not saved, sanctified, and petrified. <laughs> no. Sanctification is an active work that the Spirit is doing in us. All of us need a walk. So keep moving forward so you don't slip backwards. Secondly, verse 7, he says, grow down so you can grow up. That word rooted, that's downward growth. And then he says, built up in him, that's upward growth. But the rooting comes before the building rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught. So grow down in the faith that you have been taught so that you can grow up. Get a root system in your Christian life. A tree has to grow down before it can ever grow up. A tree has to develop a root system before it can have branches and leaves and fruit. Good fruit depends on a root, right? Good fruit depends on a root. Uh, When I first got into youth ministry, I came to this church the youth group was eight people, and uh, there was a little rural town of like 8,000 people. Uh, I had been a part of some really awesome youth groups, and I knew what I was going to do to grow it, and we did a lot of fun stuff, because I thought the first thing I need to do is I need to make this group bigger. I need to make it broader. I need to increase the breadth of this group, and after a particularly hard Wednesday night, <laughs> it was a miserable night. I had some really miserable nights in youth ministry. This was one of them. Uh, I was it was a bad night, and I was just like, Lord, what are we doing? Where are we going? How do I even begin to tackle this? And I felt like God said, if you will focus on the depth of your ministry and let me take care of the breadth of your ministry, you will see the fruit of ministry. And so from that point forward, I determined that we were not just going to be games and craziness and outings and activities, but that we were going to really study the Word. We lost some people at first. 
But over the course of the next 15 months, there was this core group who really began to develop around the philosophies of belonging just to the body, who really began to enjoy being together and studying and going. I don't know if they were, if, if you would have asked them if, the, if they would have said their number one favorite thing about youth group was studying and going deeper and how long Pastor Stephen preaches or anything like that. But I can tell you that over the course of 15 months, every single one of those kids made decisions to either follow Jesus or to grow down in sanctification of the Holy Spirit. And this core group of about 25 with an even core group of about 10 that became my student leadership team, we exploded. We exploded, not, and not just students, but in adult leadership and disciple makers and mentors. So that at five years later, I never saw a Wednesday where we had less than 100 kids. I saw over 250 kids every single month come through the doors. Unique names on the list that I was using to keep, try and keep track of all of these people that God was trusting our ministry with. But it started with growing down. And then we grew up. So to the teens that are here, I am witnessing in our own youth group that there is new energy and new excitement. You have a minister in Amanda who is passionate about Jesus, and though she rarely, if ever, feels adequate to be the leader of others to Jesus, I am seeing the Holy Spirit gather this group of a few. And you have the opportunity, in, in all of the difficulties of relationships and different personalities, to get in on the ground floor of something where you decide, I'm going to grow down in Jesus, and he can do something that you could not even begin to imagine through you. And it doesn't always come in numbers, but I am 100% convinced that when you decide together to grow down, you will grow up in profound and amazing way. So get a root system, Christians. We're not to be tumbleweeds. I probably should have asked Ben and Nicole about tumbleweeds, but uh, I didn't know this, okay? Tumbleweeds, apparently, I, I always assumed a tumbleweed was just a weed, like just a junky plant that was blowing through the desert, but they are actually a a, that's a type of weed. They actually do have a root, but it's a single root, and it, it gets dry and breaks over time, and so then that's, that, that's what you think of the tumbleweed that blows around everywhere. Tumbleweeds, bottom line is they don't have much of a root system, and that's why they tumble around through the desert aimlessly and dead, because they just have one single narrow root, and it turns brittle quickly, and it breaks off and travels through the desert, and that sounds like some people I know very narrow, and they grow brittle with age. That's not how you want to live your Christian life. Because tumbleweeds have a limited root system. They have a short life. A fruitful Christian has roots. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you will stay connected to me, if you'll grow your roots in me, if you'll abide in me, if you'll make all of your life about me, you will bear much fruit. The fruit being life abundant and blessing those who come under the shade of your tree. You will grow. And lastly, Paul says, the way that we become like Jesus, he says, thinking leads to thanking. If you believe the right things about Jesus, if you stand firm and steadfast and grow up in the things about Jesus, you will become a grateful and thankful person. Lots of understanding and growth in grace leads to overflowing with thankfulness. That is the effect of good theology. If you are down in the mouth and always pessimistic and always bummed out, I'm guessing there's something you don't understand or something you haven't internalized about Jesus. There's something lacking in your theological construct because the mark of maturity, a healthy Christian spills out with gratitude even in suffering. A healthy Christian can sit in the stocks like Paul and Silas and sing praises to the Lord our God. A healthy Christian can accomplish more from a prison cell than an unhealthy Christian can accomplish with all of the freedoms and liberties of a nation under God. It's the kind of Christian that other Christians might find slightly annoying because that's just not real. I used to feel that way. But I'm starting to realize more and more, and, and, maybe, and I think uh, Jeremiah, when he was here several months ago, really cinched this for me. 
we have no idea what is available in Christ Jesus. We live half measures of what it is to be a follower of Jesus who's filled with the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of heaven lives within. So no, it's not unreal to look at everything in life and say, but God. It's not unreal to cling to the promises and to pray unrelentingly and to believe for the impossible. Even when the impossible doesn't happen, it is not unreal. Now, we can be insensitive when we don't recognize the mood and tone of the room and try and force somebody to feel and receive that which came by much learning and growth and grace, right? But true faith growing to maturity leads to a life of thankfulness that just doesn't make sense and might be downright annoying to those of us that lack it. Paul the Apostle, the guy who was in jail a lot, got beat up a lot, basically seemed like things went wrong at every turn for him as much as went right, wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, in everything. There's no special translations. You know, when the Bible uses everything and all, they mean the same as what you and I understand that to mean. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In, this, that's what the sanctified life looks like. In everything, give thanks. Direct glory to God. Sing his praise. That is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. I don't, know, I don't know that I need to explain that any further. It speaks for itself, doesn't it? Not in everything complain, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Not in everything just be real, because nobody's actually that way. That's the will of God in Christ Jesus. No, in everything, give thanks. This is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. So that's how you become like Jesus. You keep moving forward, you grow down, and you live a life of thankfulness. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. See to it, another word in your translations might be beware. That's probably the most literal translation of the words. Beware that no one takes you captive. He says specifically by hollow and deceptive philosophy. So philosophy comes from two Greek words, phileo, which is to love, and sophia, which is wisdom or the right application of knowledge. So a philosopher ultimately is somebody who loves or pursues knowledge and wisdom. But Paul uses a slightly different word here for philosophy, not in reference to loving wisdom and loving knowledge and college courses on philosophy, but what Paul means is man's attempt to find out by his own intellect and to research those things which can only be known by divine revelation. When Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, the hollow and deceptive philosophy is the belief that your own intellect could dis discover that which is divine. The, the deceptive and hollow philosophy is that somehow you have come up with a question that stumps the creator and sustainer of the universe. That somehow you have proven that that which is infinite, you've proven in your finite condition that that which is infinite has flaws or shortcomings in his design. He says that's hollow and deceptive philosophy. There are things that can only be known through Jesus, who is God. And so the issue, he's, he's speaking uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek. He says, the issue, because the issue in Colossae is that the people were being deceived and getting confused by words and teachings that sounded an awful lot like what I just said to you. The marketing was similar, but the content's different, because the Gnostics would come and they would say, they would say, we have secret knowledge about God. But what Paul is saying is Jesus already revealed all the secret knowledge about God. He already revealed all the mystery of God, and he's about to drive that point home in verses 9 and 10. But the marketing is similar. There's, the contents are different. So several decades ago, a legend circulated that Gerber Baby Food started marketing its baby food in Africa, but it failed miserably. And the issue, the legend says, is that they package their product like they would package it in the United States with a cute little baby on the jar to sell the food. But the issue was that to avoid any language barrier, companies in Africa will typically put on the label the contents of whatever is in the product in the jar. So when an African saw, this is the legend, when an African saw the baby food, 
they thought I was baby. So it didn't sell well. Now, from, from what I've read, this is a story that circulated about a variety of cultures in a variety of ways. So that's why I'm calling it a legend. But the bottom line is, the issue, the moral of the story, is sometimes the marketing is the same, but the contents or the message is different. Likewise, this is a true story. Pepsi-Cola, when it first began marketing in China, its slogan at the time was, Pepsi brings you back to life. But their translation in Chinese was shoddy, and it read that, that, uh, that Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the grave. Which, depending on how you feel about your mother-in-law and father-in-law, might be really terrifying. Same vocabulary, different dictionary, right? Wrong information. So Paul says, beware, you need to read the whole label. <laughs> you need to dig into the information on the label. Just because someone says they love Jesus and they're saved, dig deep and see who they think Jesus is and what it means to be saved. Go beyond just the labeling. Find out the definition. He says, don't let anybody take you captive. A better translation would be, don't, anyone, don't let anyone kidnap your faith with some kind of idea that they have some kind of corner on God. I was thinking about how there are some traditions today who say that they have new revelation about who Jesus is. But Paul says in Galatians 1, if I or an angel come to you and preach to you something different than what's already been taught about Jesus, may they be eternally condemned. In other words, may they go to hell. He says, if I ever come back to you and change the message I preach to you, you just tell me where I can stick that. And that's in the hot flames of hell. If an angel of God comes to you. So think about, the, there are traditions who say that an angel appeared to them and taught them a new revelation. The scriptures are clear. Beware, you need to read the whole label. Who do they say Jesus is if it's different than what's already been said? What's been held and put forth for thousands of years it's not true. Don't be captivated by that. So Paul concludes, he says, for in Christ, in Jesus Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. So we've already kind of addressed verse 9, but Paul, we, we, in, other, in other studies on this letter, but Paul repeats it because it's the primary ass assault of these Gnostic her heretics that keep trying to say that Jesus is just one of many emanations, that he's just one of many revelations about who God is. And so it, bear, it, it bears repeating here. Paul says, I want you to understand, Jesus is God, and God is Jesus. The fullness of God dwelled in Jesus in a physical human body, period. There is no other emanation. There is no other revelation. There is no other message from any angel or from any teacher, except that Jesus is Lord of lords and King of kings, that Yahweh is God the Father that his, the expression of God the Father is Jesus in human form, and that the way that we live in him is by the Holy Spirit, which he imparts to those who believe in Jesus. But let's close where he closes the paragraph, this profound and amazing promise to you and I. Just as God gave his fullness to Jesus in bodily form, he says, you have been given the fullness of Christ. Did anybody understand the profundity of that statement? You, just as the fullness of God lives in Jesus, the fullness of Jesus lives in you. That's what he's saying to them. He says, if God is complete in Jesus, you are complete in Jesus. Because the same fullness has been extended to you. In other words, you are complete in Jesus Christ. Rabbi Yukul one of my mentors, one of my friends in my first place of ministry, he said, he, he went around and this was his testimony, I am a completed Jew. I am a completed Jew. Here's what he meant. He said, Ju Judaism always anticipated the Messiah. That was the blessing which they were given, was the gospel message about the Messiah that was to come. That was what they were set apart for, was to steward that message and to steward the truth about God to the coming of the Messiah. Rabbi used to say, we were in on the ground floor. My heritage is Jew Jewish, but now I've met the Messiah. I've met Jesus, and what I was has been fulfilled in who Jesus is. And so now, 
I am in Christ, and I am complete. I am a completed Jew, his tongue-in-cheek way of communicating that. Gnostics would say, and many say this in our culture, you're not complete in him. Jesus is a good start. We're going to take you into deeper knowledge. We're going to take you into some other fullness, into another pleroma, revelation of who God is. We're going to take you through all these little steps and philosophies and legalistic practices. And Paul's saying, no way. If Jesus is all you got, it's because Jesus is all you need. The only reason you heard about Jesus and Jesus only is because that is it. That's the fullness of God. And you're complete in Him. Paul was losing sleep over people not made complete in Jesus. He was losing sleep over Christians who had trouble holding on to their belief and becoming the fullness that was theirs in Christ. And he was losing sleep over people who hadn't yet chosen to trust that Jesus is God and the only way to be complete. Human beings are incomplete until they come to Jesus Christ. I cannot say this more clearly. Jesus is what makes you complete. So, I'm going to ask Amanda to come and just play uh, quietly in the background. What I want to present to you is an invitation. It could be that you don't know what you have this morning. It could be that you're like a lot of people who sort of live like millionaires in the bank who for some reason still feel like they need to have a second and a third job or a second and a third income. You ever know those people? Like they just feel that they never have enough. You know what I mean? What, I, what, I wanted, what I'm trying to say to you this morning is that if you have Christ, you have all the riches and fullness of God. You are a, not, not just a millionaire, you're a billionaire. You, have, you, there's, you lack nothing. So maybe what you need this morning is you need to go to the bank and be reminded everything I need is already in there. You need to go find out what you have in the bank and live and trust what you got. There's a lot of us believers who are spiritually wealthy, but we just don't know what we have in the bank. And so we need to read the scriptures. We need to discover what's in the bank book. We need to discover that the ledger says you are complete in him. And the charges that you racked up over the weekend, the charges that you racked up in this little bender or in in your backsliding, they're paid for. It's already in the bank. And you need to go and remind yourself, everything I need is in him. And then just walk it out. Live it out. I want to invite, if that's you, I want to invite you to just come and lay that on the altar this morning. Jesus, you gave me everything I need. I, this morning, am laying down my palms. (laughs) symbolically laying down what I think that I need and receiving instead what you have for me, even if it's a cross, because I know I'm complete in you. And if you're not a believer this morning, you've been exploring, you've been thinking about all kinds of things, if you haven't personally received Jesus as Savior and as Lord, let alone begun to walk in him, You may be religious, you may be a good person, you may just not know, but you haven't personally come to a place where you said, I am giving my life to Jesus, I'm surrendering it all and laying it down. Now is the time for you to rest your life on the pillow of God's grace and be complete in him. It's as simple as this, it's to recognize, God, I have a problem. The problem is, whenever I try to do things of my own philosophy and intellect and research, it ends up leading me to hollow places, wrecked by deception and just as empty and confused as I was before. Whenever I try to do things according to my own way, it falls apart. That last thing looked like it was really promising, but it blew up too. And mark my words, if you haven't experienced that, that yet, you will. I was a learn the hard way kind of guy. I want to invite you this morning. If there's anyone here who hasn't yet said, Jesus, this problem in me, it's called sin. This problem that I have of trying to make my own way and believing that I have my own truth, it's sin. And I need to surrender and lay that down 
and worship you as Savior and King? Have you not done that yet? Or is there anyone here who is not walking with him maybe? Like at one time you were, but you stopped and you walked away. You're not living a life of obedience. You just need to come back home like the prodigal son. You just need to come back home. You belong to your father. He wants to welcome you in his house. So just come home. If either of those two descriptions describes you and you're willing to change and give your life to Christ this morning, I'm asking you, please come forward and lay your life down at the altar. Make a public declaration that you need Jesus. Next week, we're going to roll out the baptismal, and you'll have an opportunity to declare that in an even more profound way. Pastors, would one of you come and pray at the altar as I pray? There's, there's, there may be more. If you need to surrender all to Jesus this morning, please come. Today is the day of your salvation. Jesus, we come to you. You are Lord of lords. You are King of kings. The complete and whole and abundant life is in you and you only. It's, it, it's you plus nothing else. Lord, there is, there's nothing that is not already paid for. There's nothing that is not already done. There's nothing that will not be done in the promises of that you have made and in the resurrection life that you have offered. Today, we just confess. We confess that our ways are not your ways and our thoughts are not your thoughts. We confess that we need to align our lives with you to find life, that you are the way and you are the truth. And we receive today your love and your forgiveness. We receive today... And believe in our, not just in, a, not just in our hearts and not just in our minds, but with our whole being, Lord, we believe that you are what makes us complete. Lord, would you equip us? Would you pour out from heaven more knowledge, more wisdom, more grace that we would know the truth about you and sense and receive your life for us. Thank you for those who have said yes to you this morning. We pray that there would be no one who would walk here without a clear heart before you this morning and that we would walk diligently to believe and become like you and beware of all of the ways that the world and its philosophies seek to tear that down and that we would grow down deep and that you would use us as a body together to minister to our world and to change the course of our community to be a light in darkness just as you have shown light into our darkness. We thank you, Jesus, for the blood. And we worship you as king this morning. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. With, uh, with respect to what's happening here at the altar, I just want to one more time and ask you to come. There are those who will pray with you. Um, and if, uh, if, you're at, if you're at peace with God, if your heart is clear, my pastor in Monette, he used to say, are all hearts clear? Then, uh, then you are uh, dismissed to go quietly. Um, but I encourage you to pray for what God is doing in and among our midst. And I hope that you have been writing down some names, like we said last week, to, uh, to go and invite, because God has a message on Easter Sunday that he wants somebody in your life to hear. So go in his grace and in his peace and celebrate his salvation.